I'm Jake Sobin. Um, I'm the sales manager uh, for our ocean science group, which is within Kongsberg Maritime and specifically in a group we call Sensors and Robotics. I would first and foremost, I'd like to welcome everyone. And uh, I would like to say a, a big thank you to Gwen for setting this up. Um, we're very excited to be a industry member to Scripps. Um, we hope this is one of several opportunities we'll have to highlight not only our current technology, um, but what we're, uh, some of the technology we're planning to develop. Um, we see this as a, a really good opportunity to talk to your researchers at Scripps and get your feedback on what technology you're currently using and what are some of the barriers of technology that's not already out there. Um, what can we be developing in order to make your research even more successful? So hopefully we'll, today is gonna be a little bit more of just a high level introduction, um, but we would like to have some dialogue today and have that continued dialogue. So today I'm gonna go ahead and give a very brief introduction because um, we would like to save most of our time to talk about uh, our current products. We're gonna break up our presentation into four segments. Um, we're gonna start off by talking about acoustics, active systems. These are gonna be our ocean science products, uh, specifically our echo sounders that are used for um, fisheries research and underwater science. We're then gonna jump into scientific research vessels. Uh, the focus here is gonna be on uh, multi-beam echo sounders and mapping. Then we're gonna cover a number of different products when it comes to positioning, navigation, and communication. And we're gonna end the presentation today by one of our uh, popular product lines, Marine Robotics, and talk about the Hugen AUV, as well as some, some of the technology we have advanced uh, for surface water vehicles. And uh, how this is gonna work is we're gonna have presentations uh, each for these segments, um, but we're gonna have a break so we make sure there's time for questions. So please do use that chat feature. Um, we look forward to getting your questions, not only during these breaks, but also at the end and after the presentation. So very quickly, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Kongsberg, we were a leading global technology company. Uh, we supply high, techno high level technology solutions um, to a number of different fields, whether that be marine, defense, oil and gas, and what we're gonna be talking about today, scientific research. In 2016, we celebrated our uh, 200 year anniversary. So we've been around for quite some time. Um, currently, we're at about 11,000 employees and, 40, and in 40 different countries. So very much a global company. We're split into three business, oh, there it goes, three business areas. Um, we're not gonna talk much about Kongsberg Defense, but so you're aware, this is the, the Navy vessel and, um, uh, this is a, a weapon control systems for Navy vessels and air defense. We'll touch a little bit on Kongsberg Digital. This is the, the sort of the new frontier of software needed uh, for digital solutions to customers within uh, maritime and oil and gas. So we'll, we'll get a little bit into that. But where our focus is going to be on it is the, the maritime, Kongsberg Maritime. So it's a very rich blend of products we have in Kongsberg Maritime. Um, the first fact I'll give you is that we're on more than 18,000 ships, um, whether that be uh, merchants, fishing vessels, ferries, offshore, and of course the, the research vessels. Uh, sensors and robotics is what we're gonna talk mostly about today. This is the platforms for underwater science, um, the sensors for underwater science, mapping. Um, but we're gonna get a little bit into the integrated solutions and, and a couple other things we do in, in Kongsberg Maritime. So we look forward to talk to you about that. Uh, so I wanna give a quick brief overview of Kongsberg Maritime offices. Again, we are very much global. Um, we're headquartered in Horton, Norway. This is our main manufacturing facility. You can see a picture there um, in the middle. Um, this is where we manufacture underwater navigation, echo sounders, sonars, and autonomy. We'll see for AUVs we'll all present on today. The rest of our offices worldwide um, support these products. So in Houston, we have a, a rich history of, of supporting the offshore industry, whether that be for dynamic positioning, um, or any type of acoustic telemetry. So we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a presentation on that today. In New Orleans, that's one of our training facilities. Uh, very unique that we're able to train a number of customers on our, our products. And last and certainly not least uh, is our Seattle office in Linwood. This is Kongsberg Underwater Technology. Um, 
you may be familiar with us, we've done a lot of support for products um, that go on the UNOS. Uh, we'll have a couple slides on that, and that includes uh, the Sally Ride and the Ravel. So we look forward to presenting today and don't want to take up any more of the time. I would like to introduce um, Jeff Condonati. He's our senior sales manager uh, for, for Ocean Science, and he's going to talk about our acoustics, active systems, and underwater science. So Jeff, can you come off mute? I'm off mute. Can you hear me? Sure can. And I'll go ahead and see if I can mute myself and I'll drop. Okay. First slide, first slide please. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Consberg is very excited to be an industrial partner to Scripps. And we've had a history with Scripps uh, way back in the day, starting with our, our first uh, echo sounder. And when I refer to echo sounders, I'm talking about a single beam calibrated echo sounder used primarily in fisheries research or measuring position or density of targets in the water column. We started in 1988 with the first commercial or first scientific research sounder called the EK500. And actually, this was used at the uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center on uh, some of their research vessels. 2001, we came out with a new design, the EK60, called the General Purpose Transceiver, GPT. And this was able to simultaneously sample multiple frequencies and also calibrate, and it was PC interfa interfaced. In 2016, we came out with a new EK80, which is a, a wide band transceiver. So we have split beam, a broad band, echo sounder, measuring fish densities and items in the water column. We also recently came out with the EK80, ADCP, which has the same interface as the EK60, and that is our newest product, which I'll discuss in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So within our group, uh, as Jake pointed out, we're a diverse group. I'll be primarily talking about the ocean science products. And these are basically calibrated tools used, as I said, for measuring densities in the water column. Uh, this is all now based on the EK80. And on this, on this slide, we have the ADCP, we have the multiple uh, EK80s, the, in the center, we have the two tubes, the WBAT, which is used by uh, uh, Simone's lab at, at Scripps. We have the variety of transducers you can see, the portable EK80 mini, and also we have the new ADCP, the EC150 ADCP, as well as the ME70 and MS70 that are sonars. Now, all these products, when I refer to the products, I'm talking about the EK80 and the uh, ME and MS70 are on the NOAA vessel Aruban Alaska, Alaska in La Jolla used by Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Next slide, please. This is the family of echo sounders. And the family is consisting of the EK echo sounder, which is a real-time Windows-based system. As you can see in the diagram, we have the Windows-based echo sounder interfacing to the transceiver, the WBT or wideband transceiver, the mini, which is the wideband transceiver mini, and the WBT tube. These all interface to a transducer or a variety of transducers. We also have the autonomous system called the EK80 autonomous system, and that is the wideband autonomous transceiver on your, on your right with the autonomous WBT mini. And all these interface to a, a variety of transducers. Next slide, please. This, this our primary customer in the United States is NOAA. And NOAA is using the EK80 as a tool to assess biomass. 
and these systems, the EK80 systems, are known throughout the world uh, as a gold standard for stock assessment tools in, in many, many countries. And we're uh, happy to support them, especially in the US. And as you can see, uh, our customers are not only with NOAA, but with, with, uh, with the university fleet. And Mark will be discussing that as well. Next slide, please. This is a matrix of the transceivers. And again, these slides will be available to you, but you can see the diversity of the transceivers from the WBT, which is basically shipborne system, to the WBAT, to the autonomous system, um, to the tube and to the mini. All these are diverse to meet specific applications of the uh, the cornerstone I would say would be the WBT which is the primary system used on ships while the other systems transceivers uh, are used in other applications that we can go over these all these transceivers are capable of both wideband and and CW we can go passive on these and they uh, interface to a variety of uh, Trans, transducers. And next slide, please. These are standard transducers mainly found on ship hulls. And the limitation is this is uh, they're rated at about 20 meters. They're installed on center boards or on uh, the hull of the ship. And all these systems, we call them the six pack, can be put on a ship and the WBT EK80 can sample all these frequencies simultaneously. So what is happening, you're in sonifying a patch under the vessel and getting returns of the similar targets at various frequencies. In the past, it was just fixed at CW or continuous wave at a key frequency like 18, 38, 70, 120, 200, and in some cases, 333. But now with wideband, we can expand that range. And so we get returns from the targets and maybe the uh, Rosetta Stone for all this or the Holy Grail is species identification. And perhaps we're getting closer to that with more information on the frequency response of the targets. Next slide, please. These are similar frequencies, but they're deep rated. These can go in some cases, or they're standard at 1500 meter ratings. And we're looking at possible beyond 1500 meters for this. These transducers are used, for example, with the Ocean Observatory Initiative or other projects where you want to put on uh, ocean mounts looking up or, or other applications. So again, these transducers are all broadband and relatively low side lobes. Next slide, please. So with the diverse applications, we had to expand our transducers. So we came out with new compact transducers, again, ranging in frequency, but the beam angle might be a little larger because of the size. But uh, the size is important because now these can fit on other platforms, which is autonomous platforms, gliders, etc. So we reduce the size to use these on small, smaller vehicles for smaller applications, you might say. Next slide, please. So you can see the diversity that what we have from the, the key, the history that Simrad or Consberg has is acoustic sampling on big ocean vessels. But now we're going into autonomy from using example sail drone, uh, uh, sail drone, and then we can put various systems on uh, towed bodies, on rosettes, on um, autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, surface vehicles, sea mounts, etc. So, next slide, please. Again, this is the application of the EK80 Mini, which is our small transceiver that is basically changed in uh, form factor to put on a variety of, of platforms. These platforms include the Slocum 
uh, glider to the wave glider to uh, uh, ROV to obviously the sail drone, which has been very successful using our autonomous EK system for managing fisheries. In fact, because of the COVID, a lot of the NOAA vessels were not able to go out for sampling and they're using sail drone with our EKs to uh, assess uh, the fish stocks for potential management purposes for, for this, this year, 2020. Next slide, please. This is an example of how the MINI, again, the EK transceiver, was changed and repackaged to put in the Remus 100. And this particular system out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uses two frequencies, a 233 kilohertz system. And basically it's modular. So you can take that system off and put on a different head that has other sensors as well. So it's extremely diverse based on the requirements of the end user. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk briefly about new products that have been uh, released by Consper. Next slide. This new product is, is basically repackaging the transceiver, the EK80 mini portable. And what it is, it's, it's the entire system all in a rugged case. It also has the PC associated with it. It's uh, multiple frequencies. It has the computer, the GPS, and it also uh, bundles in the post-processing software called EchoView. And the target is for you know, uh, shallow water lakes near shore, uh, systems and the price is extremely competitive so we can start training new acousticians to utilize these products in markets where their budget isn't like a uh, marine vessel. Next slide. The next system that we've introduced is the uh, Echo Sounder and ADCP which which just came out recently and what's exciting about this this is uh, Consberg's first uh, venture into ADCPs, but what's different about this system is we combine not only a phased array ADCP, but with a calibrated echo sounder at 150 kilohertz. So this is opening up a lot of opportunities for researchers to look at uh, direction, water direction or movement using the ADCP and correlating that with the fish behavior utilizing the quantitative calibrated echo sounder. This system with the ADCP is also compatible with University of Hawaii's CODAS or UHDAS. So it was uh, used uh, by in Hawaii, working with Hawaii to develop this product. Next slide. Here are the specs on the EK80 ADCP. And, and we would like to pursue this with Scripps because we know Scripps is doing a lot of work with ADCP. So uh, maybe if there's questions or more information or, or anybody wants more information on this, please let me know. So next slide. With that, I'm going to end that. Uh, I think, Jake, are we taking questions after this or after Mark's? We were going to go ahead and take a few questions right now, um, unless we wanted to go through Mark's. It's, do we have any questions that we want to answer? A couple right now. In the chat, so. So what I'll do is go ahead and give it to Mark. Mark Amen is our uh, sales manager for uh, Multibeam in our Lidwood office, and he will discuss scientific research vessels. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Gaiman, um, and I work with Jeff in the Lidwood, Washington office as well. Um, and Jeff has mentioned the different platforms that the acoustic systems go onto, and I'll be focusing on the the larger ones of those, the research vessels. Next slide. Uh, so the commercial products that we uh, provide are either parts of systems or their systems in themselves, whether they're ships, small boats, ROVs, AEVs. Um, and so these all have a degree of integration. And so uh, what we bring to our research vessel projects is that uh, experience of integration with a variety of partners, projects, uh, products, and customers. Um, in the U.S., our systems are used across the academic research fleet, and uh, we hope to sustain and grow that relationship the more that the equipment is used in science. Next slide. 
And so we're involved with all aspects of research vessels from the early concept discussions, designs, um, integration questions, um, a variety of different products um, of our own and, and third party. And then finally to life cycle support. So our customer relationships are for the lifetime of the vessel and beyond. So it's a, it's a bit of a marriage and uh, with that comes a commitment of support. Next slide. Uh, this slide uh, is really, let's see, I'm trying to, da, da, da. yeah, I think I've got a different slide on my screen. <laughs> got my notes. Uh, let's see, next slide. Um, yeah, this is, I that works. Um, it's sort of pointing out the variety of systems that we can offer on a research vessel uh, project. and really every primary system or you know, the system that impacts either the efficiency of the, of the ship or the efficiency of the science. Um, and so because we offer so many different products across that range, they can be optimized in different ways to work with one another. Uh, next slide. And every research vessel project we've been a part of is centered around the hall mounted acoustics. And so that's the design, everything. Um, it's really the, the starting point for most of these um, research vessels. It's the fundamental uh, science question. Um, and because of that, uh, high resolution wide swath mapping is, is one of the primary needs uh, for baseline data from uh, bathymetry and shallow water, from high frequencies to full ocean depth using low frequency multi-beam echo sounders. Um, and these by their nature are integrated systems that require inertial navigation, uh, inputs uh, for very high quality data, uh, sound velocity measurements at the surface and through the water column. So it, it incorporates the science sensors that are used for different purposes. So you could have a science seawater system uh, sampling the, the uh, sea surface for, for chlorophyll or chemicals, um, but it's also feeding the multi-beam. Um, and same with the water column, we'll use the CTD Rosette water sampling system uh, to provide sound velocity inputs uh, for beam forming. Um, so it's an integrated part of, of the science uh, mission system. And so bathymetry is important as a baseline uh, for science, but they also output uh, full water column and seabed backscatter data. So as much as you get bathymetry, you also get additional information about what's what the C4 texture is like and what the, what's in the water column. Um, and the, these two types have been used more actively in recent years for uh, methane gas seep discovery and mapping, um, but also uh, in, the, in the years ahead, we're working towards uh, calibration with the EK systems for uh, calibrated water column and seabed backscatter. Next slide. With the lower frequencies down to two kilohertz, uh, some bottom systems are beginning to penetrate the seabed. Uh, and that's important for marine geology and geophysics, and in some cases for buried targets like shipwrecks. Um, we have a variety of products in the low frequency range optimized for different depths and different vessel types um, from the shallow water, low power uh, geopulse compact system, which can fit inside a, a small uh, plastic unmanned <laughs> remote control boat, um, down to the higher power low frequency systems on ships, the SVP model. SVP29 uh, that's integrated with the hull mounted multi beam system. Next slide. Yep. Uh, so, our multi beam echo sounders, sub bottom, and EKs, and Brett will soon be speaking about the high tap, are used across the UNOLS fleet uh, for scripts. Uh, you guys are the, on the bleeding edge. So, uh, Ravel and Sally Ride are, are carrying the most recent uh, systems we have. Ravel is in the, in the process of being upgraded. Um, to an EM-124 from an older EM-122 low frequency multi-beam system. Um, and they're adding an EM-712 uh, shallow water system to that. Uh, we're mm -hmm. hoping to upgrade Sally Ride in the coming year also to a 124 and with the addition of, of a SVP three degree sub bottom system. Um, uh, recent uh, deliveries to the Enol's pool are with the deep submergence facility, Woods Hole. Um, they recently integrated uh, High frequency multi beam on Sentry. Uh, I've already done some science dives on that. And then in the last few months, have purchased multi beams for uh, Jason and Alvin. Um, so they're going to bring some advanced features to deep sea mapping research, such as uh, 600 and 700 kilohertz 
a bathymetry and backscatter, as well as multi-frequency backscatter, where you can you can collect a variety of different frequencies and pulse shapes um, as you survey. Next slide. Uh, our CRV project is one we're really proud of uh, to be a part of as the uh, acoustic system integrator. Um, these uh, involve not just our own sensors, but also third party, as well as the, uh, the visual uh, displays for the science lab. So um, researchers will be, will be riding these in the years ahead. We'll be using our, our layout for better or for worse. We'll find out how it works out, but it's, we're, we're intimately involved with the project. So, you know, as, as it goes and as it evolves, uh, there'll be some tweaks here and there, but um, these are claimed to be the most advanced UNOL ships ever built. Um, I'm sure Scripps would like to say that Ravel and Sally Ride would be even better, but um, these have been designed from the ground up to be sort of always on uh, platforms. So the sensors will be transmitting data um, all the time. That's the idea. Uh, next slide. And at last, I just wanted to um, put up a slide above the uh, current map of the ocean. Um, something we're, we're proud to be a part of is the Nippon Foundation JEPCO Seabed 2030 initiative. Um, we're actively participating in this effort and seeking ways to more effectively utilize our systems and the data that they collect. Um, and this includes developing software uh, with uh, collaboration with Kongsberg Digital uh, so that our, our systems and the data that they collect uh, can more effectively work over remote connections uh, to autonomous vehicles, as well as supporting cloud storage and, and processing. Um, so be sure if you if you uh, write any proposals to be using SolidRide or Ravel to add a track line offset to your proposal. And, uh, and every time you leave San Diego, make a slightly different heading course. So um, well, that's it for me. So uh, I guess we'll do questions and then Brad is then. Yeah, if we have any questions. You had the one question in chat that was answered, but that was, what is the beam angle for the transducers for the EK80 systems? And the answer was that it varies based on frequency. Most transducers have a seven degree beam angle. We have also have the smaller transducers with 18 degree beam angle. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Um, Grant White. Who's be speaking about? Uh, there you go. Underwater positioning communication. Thank you, Mark, and good day to everyone. Um, uh, as Mark said, I'm um, the Brett White, sales manager for um, sensor and robotics, uh, underwater positioning and communications. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jake. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, our HiPAP and the capabilities of the HiPAP, which we can have. Um, you can do um, a SSBL, or maybe you've heard it as USBL, which is uh, ultra short baselines or super super short baselines. You have uh, long baselines. You can actually do multi user, where you have multiple vessels using uh, a, a single array. Uh, and you have uh, the capability of uh, ROV tra tracking, towfish tracking, and uh, actually communications as well. Next slide. Uh, we have, uh, this is uh, our different hull units that we have available. And the, uh, the 2180 denotes the length of the uh, deployment shaft and our standard, our standard hull unit uh, is the 3770. Uh, we like to, or we recommend at least um, at least three meters below the hull to get the full optimum of the uh, opening angle or opening beam of the HiPAP uh, 500 transducer. Uh, we have, um, the, when I speak of uh, 101 or 501 or, or 502, they all use the same transducer. It's just the latest technology. Uh, next, next. Um, 
this is just, we can have dual, you can have dual high paps, you can have a, a, a triple high paps, just dependent on your application, dependent on the vessel and whatnot. Uh, uh, whatnot. Most of the drilling rigs, um, uh, big marine construction vessels, they have a, a, a dual high pap, but it also has to do with DP the classification as well. Okay. Uh, next slide, Mark. I mean, uh, Jacob. Uh, these are uh, the, when we speak of the transducers, we have the HIPAP 502, which is the same transducer. There's 241 elements. It's spherical. We have the HIPAP 452, which is this, it's the same transducer, but uh, less number of transceiver boards. So in that one, you have uh, 46 elements, the same as the HIPAP 352. Uh, the 352 transducer is a, a bit smaller. Then we have the HiPAP 102, which is our low, frequent, low frequency, and then we have the portable system. But I'd also like to uh, uh, inform everyone that we do have a portable 502 and we do have a portable 102. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the um, just covering the um, open and angle of the uh, transducer, the capability, the operating range has gone from 3,000 meters to 4,000 meters. Now the 502 is actually 5,000 meter slant range uh, uh, system. Uh, you can see the uh, range detection accuracy, which is very good. Uh, the HIPAP has a really, Consberg does a really good and uh, uh, um, um, the range detection uh, uh, and angle accuracy uh, with, with the 502. Uh, like Jacob said earlier, there's, um, there's at least 2,500 vessels with HIPAP systems on board. And one of the reasons is it is the standard or it is the gold standard of hydroacoustic systems. Uh, next one. Uh, same thing with the 352. We're talking about the operating uh, angle is plus or minus 60 degrees. On the HIPAP 500, it is plus or minus 115 for a total of 230. Same thing, this one is a 5,000 meter uh, um, uh, range or slant range. Uh, range detection is the same and angle accuracy is a little less on the 352 than the 502. Next. Oh, and I'd like to mention that the HiPAP has automatic beam, beam steering. And for, for what I mean, if you're, if you're on the starboard side of uh, your, whatever, your tow fish or behind you, all your elements are listening. Uh, every, all the elements in the, in the transducer are listening, but only a certain, ele uh, certain elements are actually being utilized for the positioning. Uh, this is the 452. It is looking straight down. There's uh, a few vessels that do have the HIPAP 452 installed, and that's because they are just concentrating on what's below them. So they're not using all the uh, elements. Uh, but if they do need to upgrade to a, four, uh, a 502, then it's just a matter of adding six more uh, transceiver uh, boards into the transceiver. Uh, next thing, uh, next one, yeah. There's our portable system. It was uh, uh, for vessels of opportunity, uh, you know, mounted on an over the side uh, um, uh, pole. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, mainly for, like I said, tow fish tracking, ROV tracking. Um, it, it's, um, the, it can have a uh, um, laptop or it can have a desktop, uh, either one. And, and again, the same as the, um, the 102, um, I think that was more of, um, uh, on a 102, you're gonna use that more for uh, AUV tracking or deep water tow fish or, or um, uh, and same as a 502 for AUVs and, and whatnot. The 352, you can use it, but it is more for um, ROV, diver, diver tracking, uh, tow fish tracking and whatnot, okay? And we have a, 
Well, I, I didn't, let me just uh, touch on the 352 portable and the 502 portable. They also come with a, uh, an INS. These have built in IM, uh, or MRUs, but you can actually get it with an, uh, uh, an INS system, meaning there's, uh, it'll give you pitch roll and heading. This one here, the standard um, 352P will, will have a MRU and it'll only give you pitch and roll and but it won't give you heading so you'll have to interface heading or a gyro into it. it it with the ins it saves you on time uh, or saves time as having to do a calibration you can do a spin check to check your offsets and whatnot but that's the good part if you put it out 180 degrees you'll know it you, you know you, you don't have to worry about it you can still go out and do your uh, uh, toe fish tracking, whatever you have to do. Uh, a full-blown calibration is required, is only required um, on the project or the accuracies of the project and whatnot, but it's pretty much calibration free. Uh, ne next slide. Uh, as you can see, the portable system can uh, be tilted up to 90 degrees back for toe fish tracking. Uh, you'll have to have a flange and uh, and, if you are going to tilt, if you are going to tilt it back on a, with a, uh, a a portable system that doesn't have a, a INS system, then I would recommend a calibration, a a full blown blown calibration. Other than that, when you have an INS, again, you can just throw it in, throw it on, and you can have uh, 22 degrees. We've had we have some tilt back fl flanges, uh, but we have uh, in in uh, in. Um, in, in instances where uh, very good results uh, when it's mounted at 90 degrees, believe it or not. Uh, next one. Uh, that's our 102, uh, deep water, plus or minus uh, 60 or 120 degrees. Uh, operating range is 10,000 meters. Um, again, this is for uh, deep water um, uh, exploration. Uh, a lot of it is uh, research vessels. Um, uh, our AUV tracking for the uh, our deep water, our 6,000 meter and 4,500 meter uh, AUVs. Next slide. Uh, this is our C node transponder. Uh, transponders they're modular, meaning that um, the one on the right, on the left side, the the maxi. Then uh, we have a midi, which uh, is uh, about half the size, and then we have a mini. And um, basically, what you can do is you can remove the transducer and put on an omnidirectional, or you can put on a directional. You have the different uh, transducers at the at the top that are, are, you can hot swap them. You have, you have multi-sensor uh, modules that you can uh, pull off the transducer, put in the module, put on the transducer. Those can be a uh, sound, uh, sound velocity uh, sensor. It can be a depth sensor. It can be a inclinometer sensor and you can have multi-sensors. Um, and you can see the different housings and different battery, uh, battery packs. You can have remote transponders. You can actually have uh, the one on the left has a release mechanism. You can pull that bottom part out housing. You can put in a, um, a uh, serial interface. Uh, um, and then you can attach um, uh, external sensors. And then they can be transmitted um, uh, via the, the high pap. And we do that for uh, monitoring, subsea monitoring, pressure and temperature and whatnot. Uh, next one. And these are our two little C Note Mini S's. Um, we have a, we have a, a deep, or I said omnidirectional and a directional. Um, depending on um, depending on what, what your water depth, the this one here is a uh, omnidirectional. It, it is 4,000 meter rated. But it's uh, it's it's good position and is good to up to a thousand meters. Once you uh, once you exceed a thousand meters, then you start to lose uh, your uh, uh, position. It'll start to get uh, wobbly due to the uh, uh, decibels, the source level. Um, uh, all, all of these, all of our transponders are four thousand meter rated. Uh, we do have some 6,000 meter or, or uh, medium frequency, and, now, and then we have low frequency transponders that are 7,000 meter. Uh, I, we do have 11,000 meter, but uh, those are rare. Um, and uh, it, we have our, you may have some of our old MSTs, 
The new HIPAPs will work with, uh, they are uh, FSK or uh, PSK, uh, to the protocol. So that's good. You don't have to scrap your old, if you have any old MSTs, they will work with a new HIPAP and, and vice versa. Um, that's it. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Ivan. He's going to talk about Sunstone. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Ivan Agranes. Uh, I'm a principal engineer and product manager for navigation products and, uh, and solution. Uh, until end of 2018, I, I used to have my office in Port Norway, uh, but I, I'm now, now located in in Linwood. Uh, however, we continue to work heavily with the office in Horton and I continue to be responsible for NavLab, NavP, Sunstone and I'll touch a little bit upon those uh, in my slides. It's a brief um, introduction, only four slides. Um, if you're interested, uh, the navigation part is probably one of the most published topics from Kongsberg and uh, I looked at my list and I found, I found seven dozens of publications from our group, some book chapters, PhD reports, but mainly proceedings and article journals. Uh, but there's a lot available in the public domain if, if you look. Um, so just some key points for the Kongsberg Maritime Aided INS. So what I'm talking about is inertial navigation, uh, which uses a lot of the acoustics that were mentioned by Brett, the HIPAP for instance, uh, one of the strengths that we've had since the very beginning is that we had have a very close relationship with uh, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishments, uh, that's FFI. And uh, our navigation system was designed originally for AUV, it's being used for uh, marine applications and other applications as well. It's also been used in in military applications and uh, and and so forth. So, uh, but originally it was made for AUVs. It's well proven and uh, it's been in operations for well close to 20, 25 years now, military and and commercial, and uh, we covered much more than a million line kilometers now using the system, running at two meter per second. So there's a lot of a lot of experience and a lot of time on this. It's being used on AUVs, uh, USVs. We have uh, on the Cassandra system that we have, uh, which is uh, a mapping system with high SAS and, and, and so forth. Uh, the other thing is that we are about two handful of people and we've been the same group most of the 20 years that we've been doing this. So the continuity and, and, uh, and the ability to continue to invest a lot of time in the development is, is, uh, is something that we consider a, a great uh, a strength. Uh, for myself, I've been involved with the, with the team since back in 2004 when, when I did my PhD work and I've been with the group since then. Uh, we have, of course, the in-situ navigation system. In addition to that, we have, and some of you might have heard about it, we have NavLab, and what we're working with now is uh, Sunstone Pustea, which is building on Palm NavLab, uh, but it's in C++ instead of, of, uh, of MATLAB. But it has the full ability to, to re-navigate and post-process the, the navigation solution due to the fact that we log all the data raw so we we can reprocess everything afterwards should that be that we use some wrong settings or uh, we need to uh, remove bad uh, bad uh, measurements and, and so forth uh, when i talk about kongsberg ins it's not only uh, navigation it's also taking care of the clock and the time synchronization of different sensors and, and also triggering of acoustic sensors to avoid, to avoid interference. And our navigation system, you know, interfaces naturally to all the KM payload sensors, be it multi-beams or, or SAS, uh, but it has also been and continues to be used with 
with other systems as well, be it the Klein, SiteScan, Edge Tech, and, and, uh, and other sensors as well. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, an overview, a uh, high level overview of the navigation system. Um, so just to distinguish between the different names that we have. So the in situ navigation system uh, used to be called NavP and it still is NavP. You can consider NavP as the, as the software. Uh, Sunstone is a packaging of NavP and I'll get to that on my next slide. So Sunstone is the Kongsberg nav navigation system in a box, you can say. So it's, uh, it's just a different form factor. And then we have our post-processing is NavLab, uh, that which is still available, and then we have Sunstone for stale. And most of the code algorithms, everything is shared, and especially now with Sunstone and Sunstone for stale, it builds on the same code engine in the bottom. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of papers and uh, a lot of papers on different aiding techniques. I can just very quickly go through some of them. We support on positioning, we support Macro Delta, which is basically feature-based. We have terrain navigation with and without maps, uh, where we generate the map in situ. Uh, we have also done work on using terrain navigation for navigating over sand ripples. So even if the, there's very little topography, we can, uh, we can detect the sand ripples and use that for navigation. Uh, obviously, LBL, USBL, GPS. Uh, we also have UTP, which is uh, a single beacon navigation. So you can deploy one or multiple uh, transponders on the seafloor and you use each of them individually. Uh, as an extension to that, we have what we call STP, which is surface transponder positioning or intelligent buoys, uh, moving or non-moving intelligent buoys. So we can use that for navigation as well. Uh, the backbone of our navigation system is, is the DBL bottom track. Uh, we also have water track, sea current estimation, and we can also support DPCA, which is taking uh, the, the measurements from a synthetic aperture sonar and using those for velocity aiding. Um, so that's very accurate as well. Uh, the last thing we also have is um, a vehicle uh, aiding, a vehicle model aiding. So we can have a, a hydrodynamic model of the vehicle and we, we can use that for aiding as well. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is the Sunstone uh, unit. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's kind of Kongsberg INS in a box. It's, uh, it has the size about like an Apple TV, like an external hard drive. So it's fairly, it's fairly compact. Uh, and it's been integrated in Hugen and, uh, and in all the Remus AUVs that are using, uh, using NAVP. Uh, they're using this box now. So, uh, so it is an industrialized product. Uh, initially, it was uh, an internal product within Kongsberg, uh, but we can provide this product to, to other external parties as well, you know, based on, uh, based on discussion. So, uh, so we're open to providing this and uh, scripts would obviously be, you know, a potential uh, partner uh, to to uh, to try or to use uh, to to use Sunstone. As I mentioned, uh, it's the navigation. It has trigger control and it has uh, the time server time sync functionality. And the Sunstone uh, name, there's a story behind it, and some might have seen it before. But uh, it used to be like in uh, Norse uh, navigation tool thousand years ago. So, uh, so it has a, has a story to it. So next up, please. So this is just uh, summarizing some of the Sunstone uh, features and technical uh, uh, specification. There's some of the features I mentioned already. Um, Sunstone is a processing unit. So there's no IMU inside Sunstone. Uh, so it's a processing unit. And uh, the time sync is basically provided, or we, how it's done is that uh, Sunstone can 
time sync to GPS or to network-based uh, time. And then it can also distribute uh, one PPS or network once you're subsea. So, uh, and you do this to your multi-beams, to your, uh, your payload sensors or other subsystems on, uh, on, on, the, on the vehicle. Um, some uh, technical details. We also have a lot of flexibility to, uh, to include new sensors and we have and will continue to do so with customers based on, uh, on particular needs. It, it's a very flexible system and we also have a global, uh, like a Google protocol buffer interface, uh, which allows, should you have a system running ROS or something else, uh, we have an interface that with an uh, API that you can use to send us network-based data and we can take that in and we have interface for a lot of different uh, generic uh, inputs, be it the position, velocity and, and, and so forth. As, as I said, dimensions are like a external hard drive. We have a five volts, one, one five volt option and one eight and a half to 14 volt option. Um, and there's a lot of serial line inputs which are fully configurable. So you can configure all of them like 232 or you can have some as 485 or you can, you can have a mix. And you can do the same with the, the trigger outputs. And there's some different logging options. We have an I API for network-based logging, which if that's, that's kind of the recommended one and, and so forth. Uh, a key, and I touched, I touched upon this, just a few minutes ago, a key um, feature of Sunstone and the Kongsberg navigation in general, and that has been the philosophy the, since the beginning, has been to be able to interface a wide range of IMUs, a wide range of aiding techniques and, and, uh, and uh, sensors, and not tying us down to particular vendors uh, per se. Uh, and that is, you know, that flexibility have been very useful in many cases and projects. So, okay, so that's pretty much uh, it for me. And then uh, the next uh, speaker is Ant Helge Olsen. He will talk about uh, Kongsberg communication and the MBR uh, radio. Hello, can you hear me, Raven? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see you have a couple of questions. I understand you. Going to answer them on uh, on the chat, yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, I work with the the marine robotics group, uh, but I took upon me to talk about communication as well, and in specific the uh, the MBR radio we use to communicate with some of our surface uh, uh, USVs. Uh, MBR is a maritime broadband radio and it's a radio system that uh, is uh, very similar to a very long range wireless system. It operates uh, over 50 kilometers, 31 miles at sea level at very low uh, altitude antennas. If you can lift the antenna higher up, you can reach uh, ranges up to 70 kilometers or longer. Uh, at a specific uh, test done in Bergen, Norway, at the land station, um, the uh, antenna was placed 600 meters uh, on a on a mountain top on shore, and they they were reaching uh, 120 kilometers offshore with the same radio. Uh, it uses five to six gigahertz, um, and it can transmit over. A, from 0.7 to 16.5 megabits per second, uh, depending on the, uh, the quality of the signal coming through. It can be used on vessels. Uh, it can be used on airplanes. Uh, it can be put on uh, smaller UAVs and uh, on personal uh, uh, equipment. Applications, we have uh, used it in hydrography. Uh, where we are transmitting the controls and, uh, and screenshots from, uh, from operating a multi-beam from a USV so that uh, a mother vessel or an onshore uh, operator is operating the multi-beam completely uh, remotely. Of course, in surveillance from airplanes, uh, vessels, uh, marine uh, operations on rigs, platforms, infrastructure from uh, shore-based uh, antennas, uh, 
there's one picture here where you even have one uh, completely uh, clogged up with ice. Uh, tandem lifting, where you have two floating barges and cranes, and you need communication between the two uh, cranes. Uh, remote operations um, on vessels, uh, between vessels, fish farming, UAVs, rig moves. Uh, you have seismic operations with a lot of um, real estate uh, in the water behind the vessel, autonomous uh, USVs and uh, oil spill combat. So there's already a long range of uh, applications this has been used in. And this system has an IP connectivity where you're, uh, where you are connecting uh, to the system through a router. Uh, so your, your uh, communication system, your video system needs to be IP, uh, capable. And of course, you can transmit uh, several uh, types of uh, packages at the same time. So you can have video and, and uh, data and uh, communication at the same time. There's a lot of different uh, types of antennas uh, in the system. Uh, we have uh, a sector smart antenna that's uh, uh, 100 degrees and 180 degrees uh, that can be vessel mounted to cover with two of these, you can cover 360 degrees. There's a compact uh, Omni smart antenna. We have uh, portable body-worn antennas where you can uh, have uh, cameras and communication mounted onto a helmet uh, of an operator. Uh, OEM units um, you can put into your own USV, AUV, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, also, uh, UAV unit, very lightweight, small uh, units and a submersible smart antenna as well. If you'd like to go and uh, look up and find out more about the system, there is a special uh, MBR website called uh, connectingvessels.com where you can find the product info, descriptions of everything, and also videos and, uh, and, uh, and uh, more ideas of where, you, where it has been used. So with that, I'm going to move over to. Uh, yeah, talk Ar, about... I don't see I don't see any questions. So go ahead and let's move on to the marine robotics. Okay, you can change. And one more. Thank you. So sensor and robotics. Uh, that's our department. Um, I work for the uh, uh, Maro Marine Robotics Group. Uh, sensor robotics. We do deliver everything from dynamic positioning uh, and we have done that for a long time. Dynamic positioning in itself is a, a very low form of autonomy uh, controlling a, a rig or a vessel. It's been used for many, many years. Um, navigation bridges, marine automation, handling systems, safety management, cargo handling, subsea survey, construction, uh, maritime training, satellite positioning, and autonomous solutions. And autonomous solution is um, what I'm working with and uh, what I want to talk about for a little while here. Um, our main system has always been and is still the uh, AUV, the Hugen. And uh, the name Hugen is also a Viking uh, expression. It's uh, one of the ravens Odin was using in the... Um, uh, to uh, to go out and spy on on all the people and bring information back to uh, to Odin the god, um, so that's why the name is Hugin. Um, we deliver a complete solution for for uh, AUVs and USVs, and with that it means topside we do need uh, to be able to handle the data we get back. Um, in that, we, uh, we have to uh, handle the uh, multi-beam data, the, uh, the camera data, and all uh, process, the SAS data, things like that. Uh, we have uh, a post-mission analysis software called Reflection. I'll come back to that a little bit later here. Also, uh, on top side, we uh, need to um, have mission control of the vehicle, where we control the next mission, and also following the vehicle if you want to do a supervised uh, operation, uh, then you would use the HiPAP to communicate through acoustics to, to the vehicle and have live data coming back through acoustics. In, uh, in the surface, we can communicate through uh, RF uh, or, uh, or Iridium or MBR. Um, and of course, uh, 
on the top side, that is where you're using the sunstone posteo to, uh, to uh, clean and filter and reprocess uh, navigation data if you have to. Uh, on the vehicle itself, um, uh, we can say that one of the most important features of the vehicle is the, uh, the payload processor because that's why we are sending the AUV down there, is to collect data. And the payload processor is um, picking up data from, uh, from uh, a SAS, from a side scan, a sub-bottom, multi-beam, uh, forward-looking uh, sonars. Uh, it can have a, a magnetometer. Uh, it can have different types of chemical and uh, environmental sensors on board. And everything is logged at the same time and it can operate at the same time through the, uh, the timing system we have on the vehicle. And that's where we come to the control and navigation processor, which take care of the timing, but also the navigation and where the uh, sunstone lives in the vehicle. Um, the vehicle will collect data from its IMU, the uh, DVL, GPS while in the, in the, in the uh, surface and receiving from true acoustics. It will have a pressure sensors, altimeter, CTD, uh, but also now we can receive uh, real-time data back from our payload. The SAS is capable of sending, uh, uh, looking, because you have overlap of uh, your pings uh, in the SAS, we can use that as a, as a correlation Doppler and sending the data back to the, uh, from the payload processor back to the control and navigation processor and use that in navigation as well. And of course, we have an output to our motors and rudders and emergency systems and controlling our, our batteries. Uh, uh, in a vehicle. So it's a complete system uh, and, and all of this is uh, placed into uh, an operation container where you have your operator systems and we have a launch and recovery container with emergency systems, air conditioners and everything you need to operate and service the vehicle while on board the vessel. Next please. The latest uh, version of the Hugen is the the uh, Hugen Superior. And uh, Superior comes from uh, uh, the fact that everything we have done so far with the Hugen, we have uh, uh, made into a 2020 uh, version of it and made superior to the uh, the other Hugen. We have a dual HiSAS system now with dual HiSAS receivers, making um, the vehicle capable of collecting uh, a wider SWOT up to 1,000 meter uh, side to side um, with a higher speed. And like I mentioned earlier, we can use that data in micro navigation, TCPA to, uh, to, to the nav system. We also have a superior EM2040 Mark II system on the vehicle now for the nadir collection of data. We have a new 48.5 uh, wide aperture camera and a laser system on board, dual uh, SWOT uh, sweep uh, laser. Um, improved uh, navigation means longer times between updates. Uh, so uh, with the system, we have improved uh, our navigation from 0.08% um, of travel distance to 0.04. So the navigation has improved uh, by double now. We also have a new battery coming uh, with this vehicle uh, with uh, more than 30% more energy. Um, we can operate uh, most of the sensors um, at uh, three knots now and, and uh, achieve up to 80 hours of, of, of dive. Um, faster download. Uh, we have a new bus system in the vehicle between the uh, payload and the navigation, which is uh, 10 gigabit per second bus between the systems. And all the data goes onto a NAS disk on board, which is uh, a little bit over 15 terabyte uh, in size. And uh, believe it or not, we can change that uh, and download that in uh, probably 10 minutes because we we put the, the uh, NAS disk inside a pressure bottle. So uh, when you uh, take the data off, you unscrew and take off the pressure bottle with the NAS disk and swap it with a fresh one. Next, please. The Loom is um, the version of uh, 
or AUV, which is uh, more agile. It's uh, articulated, it has joints, so it can move like a, a, a snake. Uh, it can actually swim with the movement, but it has thrusters to get more more thrust and speed. Um, and um, because it's um, articulated, we can uh, do more th uh, things with it. We can hover, we can mount uh, uh, tools on both, both ends of the vehicle. One end can actually have a, a gripping arm and, and the other tail is, is using a camera to look at what the, the other end is, is, is doing. We can get into very confined spaces, uh, into tubes, into uh, pipes, things like that, under structures. And um, we can move in six degrees. We have six degrees of freedom with this vehicle. Next, please. Um, now also we have moved uh, our, our autonomy onto a, a, a vessel platform, an eight meter long um, uh, polyurethane, uh, built uh, vessel that is made by a lifeboat company in Norway. And they build uh, these boats uh, normally to save people. So it's a very strong built uh, vehicle, vessel with a, 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 an ice hull in the front. So when, uh, if, you're, if you do hit something, you have a double hull uh, and foam in between. It's fire resistant and, uh, and uh, has an engine, a diesel engine that can turn upside down in bad weather and uh, it will stop at that point. And then when it turns back again, the oil will uh, uh, go back to the right place and you can start it up again. It's, it's capable of capsizing. Uh, we can mount um, uh, multi-bin systems on this uh, vessel with, through our moon pool. We can have EK80 systems on here, fishery research uh, systems. And we have a winch at the back, which we can use for uh, automatic uh, uh, velocity profiles, letting it out and pulling it back, back in again. And uh, you can also tow other systems if uh, that's required. Next, please. Thank you. So I also wanted to mention uh, our um, post-mission analysis uh, software I mentioned earlier, Reflection. Um, and this is uh, uh, an image of uh, a wreck, uh, courtesy of uh, Royal Norwegian Navy and FFI in Norway. It's, it's collected with a SAS system. Please, next one. Next, please. So the purpose of the um, Reflection post-mission analysis software as you can see to the left is um, to, uh, to uh, visualize the data collected uh, as quick as possible when you take all the data back with, uh, in the Nest bottle. And with the software, we can overlay all of the different sensors in the same image. So you get to the same data point uh, very, very quickly. Um, you can see the multi-beam systems, uh, the camera systems, the bottom systems, uh, the SAS, or chemical sensors also in this image. So uh, if you're interested in seeing what what is there on the camera when you see something on your chemical sensors, is uh, is, is is all there at the same uh, in the same software. On the top right, you see a sub bottom, uh, and, and the, the three smaller ones are uh, a camera images uh, picked up by the camera. Next, please. In this image, you can see uh, a reflection software where you have a SAS to the side, you have a multi-beam in the middle, uh, in the near middle, and in the center, there is uh, camera images. And these camera images are still images that overlapped each other. But you can also, um, you can also um, bring in other types of, uh, of sensors to the software. So the software is very versatile. With, with all the sensors you uh, are connecting to it. And it's compatible, of course, with the Hugin and Moonin and, uh, and, uh, and all the vessels if you need. Next, please. That's what I had for uh, the main robotics. Art, Art, you questions? had a question. Yeah, there was a question um, about the Elum. How, what does long range mean for the Elum? So the Elum uh, is designed so that you can uh, you can uh, you can make it very short with one module. You can add a, 
a joint and another module. And in every module, you can have a battery. So you can make these uh, uh, the several joints and uh, modules. I think the longest one made so far is almost uh, seven, eight meters long. It's incredibly long and you can have a separate battery module. So long range is actually uh, only uh, limited by how much battery you want to put into this modular uh, system. So the exact uh, how long the, this eight, nine meter vehicle can drive, I'm not exactly sure because there is battery in every module and there's extra separate battery modules. So it's quite long, it's, uh, it's uh, several hours. Yeah. So it's designed to be able to move from one structure at the seabed to another structure. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have received. Um, Douglas, did, do we want to turn over to you for the, the close out? Sure. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the team from Consberg Maritime for the presentation today. And I uh, just want to let everybody know we're working on bringing additional speakers over the next few months. In August, Regal Laser System Measurement Systems will make a presentation on LiDAR and its applications. September, we have Geospectrum Technologies Incorporated, and they will discuss underwater acoustics. October, Turner Designs will provide information on submersible fluorometers and sensors. And as always, we welcome your input on future speakers. If you've attended an STF in the past or look at the website, you'll see there's a heavy skew towards physical oceanography and ocean sciences. This is not intentional. Please let us know if you have an internal or external speaker that would be of interest to our community here at Scripps as STF should be reflective of our diverse research interests. And uh, you know, I like the Zoom format. I think that we get a good attendance, but please uh, let us know if you have any comments about the format or how it can be improved. And uh, with that, um, unless there are any other questions, I'll uh, just say thank you and have a good um, weekend.